tonight we are going to um, be talking about a topic that you can take a deep breath and relax in the sense that we will not get through it tonight. Not possible. And uh, I had hoped so. And then as you dig and as you dig and as you uncover and as you find out more and more about this topic tonight in our Worldview series, uh, the more uh, information you gather and the more fantastic these arguments are and the need for data to be displayed or exhibited. And so uh, tonight we'll begin to scratch the surface on our Worldview series topic, which tonight is this. It is, what is environmentalism? A worldview topic. And so I'm going to ask you guys regarding this to take notes this evening. And as you look at Acts chapter 17, verse 28, turn there in your Bibles if you would. Regarding our worldview series, Acts 17, 28. If you don't remember, Paul was now in Athens, Greece. He's been waiting for his ministry team to arrive. And as he surveyed the city of Athens, that great monumental city of world thinking, of philosophy, of the sciences, and of religion, uh, Paul was observing the culture. And like any good Christian, uh, he takes it all in. He's watching the practices and listening because he has come there for a purpose. He's come to Greece not to see the tremendous sights and the great archaeological uh, manifestations there unveiled from the past, but he's also come there to experience the seat of, of much of what Rome had to build on. The Grecian Empire being subdued by Rome, Paul now a Roman citizen, having been born such, is now a citizen of heaven, and he's taken the gospel of God into Europe and preaching Christ, that Jesus had died on the cross for the sins of mankind, the ancient Hebrew scriptures fulfilled in the person of Jesus. And he had been preaching it, and he had been delivering the message, and as he waits to set up his ministry headquarters there for that season there in Greece, he's in Athens and he sees all of these images to amazing assortment of gods. I've had a chance to be both in Berlin at the Pergamum Museum and in Greece in various cities to see these gods. And it's, it's, it boggles your imagination. Gods of every sort. You and I are familiar with some of them, but there were so many. And Paul is looking at all of them, and he sees this pedestal where there is uh, a faceless deity represented there. And because the Greeks did not want, listen, they never wanted to offend the gods for fear of arousing the anger of the gods. So just in case they might have forgotten a god and not paid homage to that god, they erected this statue which said, to the unknown god. Just in case we missed any god, we don't want the god that we might have missed to be angry and then destroy our Grecian culture. And so they're very scared about that. The Greeks were amazing people, but they were terrified by the nature or the capriciousness of their gods. If they did something wrong, if they didn't satisfy the god of the harvest or the god of the moon or the god of the sun or the god of the underworld, everything would come apart. It was a horrifically superstitious type of life. And Paul comes now into the city knowing the one true God, the one and only God. Can you imagine? As a Christian, you walk around this world, you live in this life, and I know, I trust anyway, that uh, you feel as I do, that we may be dressed in human clothes and human body, but don't you feel like you're almost an alien in this world because of what you know? And don't you want to just grab people if you could? And, and I have thoughts like this, to be able to grab somebody and stick a, like a you know, a wire in their head and a wire into my head and download all the stuff that we know about God because we walk around this world and we know the living God. And, we, and if we could, we could just grab somebody and say, listen, you've got to hear this and have them believe it. And listen, uh, conversion and salvation is not by compulsion. It's not by constraint. It's got to be a willful choice. Uh, 
choice or choosing of your own. Our God is not some sort of a, a spiritual uh, uh, thug or rapist in the way of spirit like you must believe or else. He invites you to know him because he's a God of love. He uh, encourages you to know him. He encourages you to bring all of your sin to him. Go find a God like that in the universe. Go find a God like that in Athens. You can't do it. Where God says, you bring me all of your grief, bring me all of your sins and all of your wrongdoing, your lying, your arrogance, your cheating, your, your whatever it is, and I'll wash it away if you just come to me and believe in me. The Bible says that the righteous are to live by faith. The just shall live by faith. And so Paul is waiting to deliver that message and what's interesting, as we talk about our 21st century and this word of environmentalism, you might think that this is a, a recent issue, that maybe it's, you know, it's been about the last 30 years, but the last five years, is really, or the last 10 years, it's really become a big deal. Listen, it is an ancient, ancient belief. And it goes way beyond the Greeks in their day because they had gods of the harvest. They had the gods of weather. They had the gods of various parts of the earth. And they were to be worshipped. And if they were worshipped, then you might have a good summer or you might have a good winter. You might have a good crop or you might have whatever. Solomon said, and he said it rightly, that there's nothing new under the sun. And we need to remember that. So in all of this, my prayer is that you listen carefully and do come back in the next several weeks. We're going to be covering this topic. Uh, it's just too big to handle in one night. But when he says there in Acts chapter 17, verse 28, he says, for in him, as he argues and presents the one true God to the Greeks, he says, for in him we live and move and have our being. A trichotomy of effect. We live, that is, we receive life. He's the life giver. He is the sole proprietor of life, and he quickens the human being, or he's the giver of life. Secondly, we move. That is, our lives are stirred, aroused, and awakened by this God of the Bible. And then thirdly, our being, our very existence, our personality. And listen, the individual, individuality of who you are, of who we are, is ordained by God. Paul says it's in him that you live and move and have your individuality. And I don't know how often you think about that, but you should rejoice over that, that the creator God of the universe has made you an individual person, that he has imparted to you by divine decree your own ability of choice. You can choose to do anything you want to do. St. Augustine said it radically. St. Augustine said in the life of the believer, he says, now that I'm a believer, I choose, I can choose to live, live any life or any kind of life I want. Did you know that? Augustine said that. I can choose to live any kind of life I want now that I'm a believer. Isn't that a radical declaration? And you kind of hold your breath and say, oh, oh, what's coming, right? But then he said, I choose now to live for Christ. And that is a, a very brief but accurate definition of what it is to be a real Christian. I'm not talking about a pretend Christian or a make-believe or a goofball or the, tr or the quintessential American Christian. I'm talking about a real Christian, a heaven-born Christian. I now, you as a believer, I as a believer, I can choose to live any life I want to live now. I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. But the proof that I'm going to heaven is not lived out and how willful I live my life, but how I joyfully, gladly yield my will to his will that he might live his life through me, through us. Amazing. So listen, grab your Bibles, turn as we consider what is environmentalism, turn to Genesis chapter 1, Hold your finger right there, and on the screen, I'm going to have the guys put up our points that we'll be looking at over the course of this evening and the next couple of uh, weeks together. Genesis chapter 1. And so right here, right now, on the screen, there they are, any second. 
We're going to be looking at the meaning of environmentalism. What does it mean? We're going to be looking at the meaning of it. Why is it important? Go ahead and leave it up on the screen. Why is it important? Because those of you who are in college, those of you who are in high school, junior hires, even younger now, are hearing about this term. But what does it mean? Uh, we'll analyze that to, to the best of our ability with the time limits that we have. Then secondly, we'll be looking at the origin of environmentalism. Thirdly, the cause a little bit of a play on words. There's the cause of, and there's the cause in the sense for environmentalism. Fourthly, we'll look at the fallacy of it. What's wrong with environmentalism? Why does it not work? We'll look at the data. Probably next week or the week after, we'll be giving you guys a lot of data from the United Nations, from the U.S. Department of Commerce, Department of Energy, the uh, European Union as well. The fallacy of environmentalism. Fifth, the effects of environmentalism. What are the effects? What's the result of the environmental campaign? What effects has it had on cities, states, or nations in the world? You need to know that. I guarantee you, most of you don't know what has come out of the environmental movement. You'll be shocked to find out. We are so sheltered in America, we think that cute little things like uh, the Volt, General Motors electric car, came out of this movement. Uh, let me tell you something. That's not it. You will be shocked when you see the world data from uh, the World Health Organization and others. And then the reality of environmentalism. What's the reality of it? We'll do our best tonight to go as far as we can. We We'll stop on time because uh, we've got nothing to rush through. Genesis chapter 1, here's our foundation. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Underline God created. Genesis 1, look at verse 11. Then God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its genus, its kind, its code. That's a scientific word God gave there 5,000 years ago. Whose seed is in itself, self-replicating, awesome, engineering, on the earth. And it was so. Verse 20, and God said, let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament, of the heavens. That is the, not the stars, that is the atmosphere, uh, the oxygenated atmosphere where birds would fly. Verse 21, so God created great sea creatures. That's a freaky statement because it means what you and I think it does and stuff we don't know anymore of. Freaky things. And every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Verse 25, and God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Verse 26, then God said, this is key, let us, interesting, huh? Who's he talking to? He's not talking to angels. We know that for a fact. Let us make man in our image, in our moral likeness. According to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, underlying all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So verse 27, God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him, notice this, listen, male and female, he created them. It's the only moment where man, male, male, man, come, not the male man, but a male comes first by the creation of God, then the female comes out of man, only one time only, out of the side, through the amazing code, the DNA, 
of Adam coming out of his side. And then from that moment on, Adam calls her Eve because from her, all of us would come. And the Bible says exactly how hematoma, hematology, uh, biology, chemistry, anthropology backs that statement up to this very day. It is awesome to realize. And you heard it over and over again. God said, I will make this after its own kind. It will replicate the engineering of God, the brilliance of God. And just to make people scratch their heads who don't want to believe him, God creates even a platypus. When's the last time you saw a platypus? You know what I'm talking about? People don't like to even put those in books anymore because it freaks evolutionists out. You got a beaver thing with a duck bill. He's got front feet and he's got a webbed back legs. Like a, it's, it's an absolute mess that nobody can figure out where it came from. God, I think God just said, let's put this one in a blender and see what comes out. And amazing stuff. The engineering of God, the brilliance of God is everywhere. And when the Bible says God created, this is that Hebrew word bara. And it means absolute creation. This is an amazing word, people. That one word attacks the evolutionary theory. Because God brought things out of nowhere and made them exist. He didn't take something and brought it, bring it, nurture it, uh, shape it along in time. He didn't uh, say something and then it evolved over a billion years and then it was and then he said, okay, now it's good. He brought stuff from nowhere into something. There was, there was no, um, God didn't have a shopping cart of stuff and then throw it out into space. He spoke it and, it and it came into existence. He created from nothing all that there is. This, just think of that for a minute. You and I, in our most creative best, can only create using things that already exist. The closest thing that we can do to be like God in creation is to have a, an imaginative, creative thought. Once that thing is in our mind, we have to use existing things to make it a reality. Not God. He says, I want Jupiter. Boom! And it's there. He's amazing. And immediately we're faced with the question about this issue of environmentalism and environmentalists. Now, let me be very careful and very loving. I get excited about these topics, so I'm not angry at you. I, somebody said, you're always yelling all the time. It's, it's, it has, it's, I'm not mad at anybody. I just get very excited about these things because I love this stuff, and I love to know things, and I love to know, honestly, I want to make sure that in my own life, that I'm on the right track. I don't want to be on my track. I want to be on God's track. <laughs> I don't want to ever be on my track. But when we talk about environmentalists, let me make this very clear. Environmentalists are not necessarily mean, brutal, ignorant, goofball, strange people. We see the CNN version of environmentalists often. An environmentalist is a person, as we'll, show, as, as we'll see more, is a person that's very concerned about the environment, the, in a sense almost obsessed with the environment. And in, in giving them the benefit of the doubt, they, are, they see that from the environment is, is derived our existence. I understand that, and I don't disagree with that. But where we disagree with the rational environmentalist is the origin of it all, the management of it all, and the end of it all. It is our doctrine. It is our worldview. You tonight may be here with what is called a secular environmentalist worldview. Most of us tonight, I mean, I'm in a church right now, so I'm guessing that most of us tonight come from a Christian or a better yet biblical worldview. And those are the two arguments. This camp may vary in definitions and representations and people who have certain views, but the other group is the biblical worldview. Which one's right? Which one's true? What does the evidence in science display? That's all important. It's necessary. And so, when we look at this, keep a few things in mind. 
I asked you this at the beginning of the series quite a few weeks ago now. When it comes to environmentalism, is it a political issue? Is it a moral issue? Or is it a spiritual issue? Which one is it? All of them, isn't it? All of them. The very argument is in all camps important. You are in a campaign year. Environmentalism will come up in the campaign among the candidates. It will be discussed. They will speak about it. People will vote based upon it. Is it a moral issue? Oh, yes, in the weeks ahead, you will see how much of a moral issue it really is. And is it a spiritual issue? The Bible, I just read a few verses where it's absolutely a spiritual issue because you either, listen, you either believe that God created it. Listen, everybody, I'm going to say something here pretty soon that might shake you. You either believe that God created it or you believe it evolved. Unfortunately, there is a rising group of people in modern uh, evangelicalism that they don't believe either one much. They, they do believe that God created it, but he is unable to sustain it. He made, this is, listen, this is huge in churches across America. He made it, but it's gotten out of hand, and he can't, he can't supply, he can't take care of what he has made. I simply call that your little God religion. You call yourself a Christian, you read the Bible, but your, listen, your worldview has been so tainted by the doctrines of this age, college classrooms, the interpretation, modern interpretation of what is today called science rather than facts. It's been spun in such a way that now you have got a God that you believe in, but he can't sustain or maintain the created universe, especially earth that he has made. And some of you are looking at me like you're constipated. <laughs> and I'm telling you, you need to go visit a college campus. Because you've got people saying, oh, I'm a Christian, but if we don't save the earth, it's all going to come to pieces and be destroyed. And you, listen, only emotionally can you reconcile those two views. You cannot reconcile those two views logically or scientifically or religiously. Or did you hear what I said? It's emotionally based theology and the issues are driving more of your belief than the biblical mandate of scripture. Are you with me now, everybody? We just read that God created, God said, God gave, God ordained these things to be so. Church, do you believe that God created the heavens and the earth? How big, is, uh, my question to you then is how big is your God? If he is the God of the Bible, he knows how to manage the earth. And this is going to be a lot of fun, I think. The topic and the issue of the environment is one that will not go away, and it's not intended to go away. It's only going to increase. Number one, as I said, it's an election issue. Number two, it's a policy issue. Number three, it's an, it's an economic issue. Number four, it's a social issue. Number five, it's a global issue. And as I mentioned earlier, number six, it is a spiritual issue. But why is the environment an issue at all? I'm just asking you the question. Listen, I, I, I really would love you to think this through all the way. Why, I'm just asking, why in the 21st century, right now, this year, why is it an issue at all? Why, ha why has it been an issue, the environment? Why, where does it come from, this interest, this concern? Let me say this from the start before any more people get out and leave. You see this land you're sitting on right here? Okay, this is 13 acres. If you lived in the area um, eight years ago or nine years ago, now I forget. If you drove by this place, this was a barren, flat piece of dirt. In fact, when the winds would blow, it would blow dust all over the place. Barren. There was not a bush. There was not a tree. We say, where are you going with this? Just hang on. 
If you think for a moment that I or Christians are anti-environment, you need to hear this. These 13 acres were barren. To have church here, it was uh, required by the state. We had to pay for a state biologist to fly down here from Sacramento. I kid you not. And that biologist sat in a lawn chair eight hours a day for a week and a half. And we had to pay the state of California a big bundle of money for that biologist. As he looked and observed and looked for any burrowing owls or uh, the, the uh, Hall's Vario bird, and then he signed off on property that we owned, you owned. Then he signed off and said, okay, they can build. And then the state said, okay, this is how you will build. You will have 400 or 300 and some odd trees and 1,000 some odd bushes and shrubs. And you comply with that. Why? Because we, gave, we rendered unto Caesar the things that Caesar wanted so we can preach the word of God because he wants you. Render to God the things that are God's, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. And so we paid uh, nearly a million dollars for all of the stuff that we had to do to meet the environmental demands. You paid it. Me, you, us together. When you flush these toilets, when the rainwater runs off of these driveways into the, into the drains, just from the parking lot, from your car, you should see how much money and the amazing devices under this ground required by the state of California that scrubs that water before it ever goes out into the uh, creek bed behind us or wherever it goes. I don't know where it goes. I'm not knocking it. That, that may be even really good creation care of the environment. We didn't protest having to spend all that kind of money. But let me tell you this. On these 13 acres, there are more trees now and it is more of an environmental blessing now than it was when it was left barren. Did you hear what I said? This flies in the face of much of what environmentalists declare. They, wanna, they, want, they preach an untouched earth doctrine. And yet I can tell you right now, there are thousands, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of bird, wild birds now that have made this place their, their, their living space. We've, in fact, you have all kinds of doves and pigeons that now have lived, that moved here. And, and to just complete the circle of life, just come out here in the middle of the day and watch how many hawks fly by and kill the doves and pigeons and eat them. And then at night, in the middle of the night, coyotes come by, run down the courtyard and eat the wild cats that are coming out. It's an amazing ecological system <laughs> that now is working here that previously did not exist, and we're all for that. I believe that Christians should be the best custodians of the earth because our God made it. I really believe that. And so we have been. So to speak on or to address this issue of environmentalism or ecology or the environment, listen, you must confess that God is the designer if you put some thinking to this because, listen, Please hear me out on this. This is all introduction to where we're going. If, you're, if you tonight, you would say, I am an environmentalist, then I would like to introduce you, if you don't know, I'd like to introduce you to the creator of all the wonderful things that you see and that you appreciate. If you're an environmentalist, you love, you love how amazing whales are. And I think whales are awesome. I love them. They're fantastic. What's cool about it is the whale, if that whale could talk, that whale would say, you know, <laughs> you ought to meet my maker. If you think these fins are cool and how they work, you should see the God who made these fins. If an animal could talk, it would probably tell us about the amazing engineering abilities of our great God. If you look at the environment and you say, wow, it's spectacular, it's awesome, and it's worthy of our protection, I want you to think one more thought beyond that. Who made it? Because you cannot be an evolutionist. 
and be an environmentalist, in my opinion. It's not possible. Because if you are a, a true, fundamental environmentalist, an evolutionist, you're going to have a problem. Because evolutionism, the evolutionary theory is, it's the survival of the, of the fittest. And so only the fittest can survive. That which is reproduces survives. That which is, is going upward and onward survives. That which is weak is to be eliminated or destroyed. And a pure evolutionist would not be concerned because the evolutionist believes that everything is an accident. It is a moving accident. It is in a state of chaos. And whatever it does, it somehow, remember in Jurassic Park, Jeff Goldblum says, life will find a way. That's the evolutionary mantra. The mantra of the evolutionist is life will find a way. In environmentalism, you are really actually in awe of what God has made. And you're being tempted to worship what God has made rather than the maker, God himself. And we'll talk about that. It's very important. Genesis chapter 1 verse 10 says, And God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters he called seas and God saw that it was good then God said let the earth bring forth grass the herb that yields its seed we read that earlier according to its kind down verse 12 at the end he talks about the fruit trees yielding its fruit after its own kind and God saw that it was good he's the designer he's the engineer of it he separated the waters and brought forth the earth as a believer in God we believe that he knows what he's doing and in Genesis chapter 1, look at verse 31. The Bible says, Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. Very good until what, church? Very good until Adam and Eve sinned against God. And the Bible says that the creation was then placed under a divine curse by God. And listen, it's not cursed by God because God was upset. It was cursed by God because of man's disobedience. Hear me out, listen. The earth is cursed. The Bible says it's cursed. You all know it's cursed. Listen, those of you who are 30 years of age or younger, you're fine. You don't know it's cursed yet. But after, I don't know, it seemed to me when I hit 35, my body began hurting at 35 years of age. Every day I wake up, I know the earth is cursed. <laughs> Things hurt. Here's the thing. God says, listen, he didn't say that it's cursed in such a way that it's destroyed. He said to Adam and Eve, it's cursed in such a way that you'll be able to farm it, but boy, is it going to be hard. And hey, hey Eve, oh, you're still going to have babies, but boy, is it going to hurt. Yeah, didn't he? There's just enough curse where God says, and the evidence is overwhelming, because death came into the world via sin, but there's still just enough good and residual blessings from God that is amazing to me. It's amazing to me that there's any good at all, anywhere, anyhow. And the Bible says the good that is comes from God. So not all hope is lost. And it is my intention as we go through this little mini-series within a series that you think, write down your questions if you have them, let's get them answered. But I think if you follow this through, it's going to be a pretty cool revelation. Listen, make note of this. The argument of the environmentalist is we need to go back to the natural. It sounds good. Don't you, I mean, I like, I guess I like free-range chicken eggs. That's all my wife will buy is chicken eggs that have been laid by chickens who are free. American chickens. <laughs> Red, white, and blue chickens. Look, I do, how do I know when I crack that egg and eat it, gosh, this really tastes like a free-range chicken egg. I don't know. The carton says it's free-range. What's the point to this? It's natural. We're big on natural. Is that natural or does it have additives? We're big on that stuff. 
Why? Because we think natural is pure. We have to remember, we are in a fallen world. Okay, now as we go through this, listen. The argument of the environmentalist is to leave things natural or go back to them being natural. But let's remember their premise, though very sincere and zealous, is a flawed premise. Their foundations cracked before they even build. Here's the reason why. When you, when you as an environmentalist want to talk about what is natural, God says it's under a curse. The parts that you, that you have are broken. You say, I don't believe you, Pastor. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Because if we were to turn on right now, you know, the Wild Kingdom animal show or, or a National Geographic or whatever, and you'd be watching this beautiful gazelle just springing along, and you, in your environmentalism, would say, oh my gosh, it makes my heart leap. I feel so fantastic watching this animal in its natural environment. It's nature in its purest form. Let's get back to the natural. And then that little gazelle leaps right into the mouth of a lion. <laughs> and there's fur and blood and bone flying everywhere. Right? That's natural. <laughs> Look, we say it's natural. Because we, as it were, as it were, we have crawled out of the pit and just got our head at eye level and looked around, and God is looking from above, and he says, Oh, all of nature groaneth and travaileth until the redemption of the sons of God, until, until nature is restored. Did you know that God looks at it and says, Unnatural! Did you know that? Young people, did you hear me? Oh, no, we want natural. Okay. Then go swim tonight on the, on the west shore of Catalina. Just take a swim. You will bump into great white sharks. It's one of the greatest concentrations of great whites. 26 miles from here, out in the middle of the water. Go out there. So, oh man, this is so natural. I just feel natural. And that shark takes your leg, and the shark goes, yeah, it's natural. Listen, God says, that's unnatural. God didn't make it to die. He didn't make it to kill. He didn't make it. This is the result of a fallen world. But even after the world had been fallen, God says to Adam again, go and subdue the earth, preside over it, tend to it, keep it, take care of it, and listen, govern it. The word actually means in Hebrew, Go to the world, Adam, and cause it to be useful to you. That's what the word means. Look it up if you don't believe me. God says, Adam, make the world useful. And I want you to think about that for a second. The environmentalist will say, and this is a tragic truth, and I'll give you data in the next few weeks. Did you know that where the United Nations has adopted an environmental doctrine and then imposed that doctrine upon certain areas in Africa, which the doctrine was to stop spraying wetland areas for mosquitoes. This is a fact, and I'll give you the data. Because it's, it could be an environmental hazard. So they stopped spraying certain areas against mosquito control, and the mosquito infestation got so huge that malaria now is killing human beings at a massive scale. Did you know that? This is common knowledge, a United Nations decision, and humans are dying. And the environmentalist will not stop and will not overturn their own doctrine on this. Why? Because it is a doctrine of a worldview that exalts nature over the crowning jewel or gem of God's creative uh, works in nature, and that is mankind. It is the worship of animals or things more than the creator himself and what he values as precious. And so we have to buy mosquito nets or we have to get repellent or we have to do what we do. Now let me ask you, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do about that? 
would Jesus say, gosh, you know what? I made mosquitoes and I made people. Mosquitoes, people, mosquitoes, people. For God so loved the mosquitoes that he gave his only begotten son. Ladies and gentlemen, do you know what I'm talking about? Do you hear me? You, you, you're going to have to square with this because, listen, what, what's really beautiful about what we're doing here right now is causing some people in this room to think. Yeah, but the sprain, the, it, it could hurt something. Really? Did you know that you go to the grocery store and you can have oranges and apples? You can pick various types of apples. You can buy all kinds of stuff. Did you know that you don't have to worry about mad cow disease when you eat a steak here? You want to know why? Because God gave us a brain to use to better the quality of life. It is absolutely amazing. And we're going to see data on that as well in the weeks ahead. Radical environmentalists believe that the natural state or the untouched state is the only way to live. And I found it interesting to read today in an article that there have been engineers that have developed varieties of fruit and by the way, they thank God we have them in California, Israel as well, but they've designed types of fruit that are resistant to certain insects and mold so that the crop of fruit is so big that they have to export it to other people. And listen, are you listening? We're, at, we're almost out of time, man. I can't believe this. Where in the world is the highest or longest um, age expectancy. Longest, uh, uh, what do you call it? L life lived. What, what do you call it? Lifespan. Lifespan. Where? Are they in, indust listen, are they in industrialized nations or the poor nations? Where do people live the longest? In nations that have been industrialized or nations that are uh, poor and uncivilized, I'll, for lack of a term. If you live in a poor nation, it varies in what nation you're in, but the expectation of life, the lifespan, is almost half compared to those in industrialized nations. See, many of you said that you live longer in a poor nation. I heard it. Either you didn't understand what I was saying or you don't, or you don't know this. Listen, isn't it amazing that the, the more poor a country is, the shorter lifespan people live and the infant mortality rate is high. Why do you think, why? God said, Adam, preside over the earth. Everything I've made, use it to the betterment. See, you and I have been told by our schools that cars are bad, that factories are bad, or that medicines are bad, airplanes are bad. Imagine telling Thailand or Japan or Haiti in their time of great peril and need that we would love to help you, but we're not about to fly a 747 across the Pacific because it could possibly create some pollution, and so we're not going to do it. We're sorry for your devastation. Think about it. These are things that you and I live with every day that we never think about. Don't raise your hand, please, but are you sick? Are you in need of medication? Do you need, are you are you're under cancer treatment right now? Or are you on an antibiotic? Do you realize that the environmentalism doctrine would have, if in place, would have prohibited the creation of that. Have you ever heard of cap and trade? Do you know what it is? Most Americans don't know what it is. That's why it's getting a lot of traction. Because, again, Mikhail Gorbachev said, always take advantage of the Americans' desire to not want to know. We love to be entertained. We don't like to know things. 
cap and trade is this. It's an environmental doctrine that says, for example, David, let's say that you make basketballs and your company makes the best basketballs in the world. Everybody wants your basketballs, but here's the problem. Your company is growing so fast that there are more trucks having to bring leather and rubber and thread to your location that that could affect the environment. So what CAP is, we will see to it under federal law that you can only make 15 basketballs a month. You can't sell any more than that. That will limit the size of your company. You'll only be able to have 20 employees. And that opens the door for other people to create basketballs and they can compete against you, but you cannot become a big company because you could affect the environment. That's CAP. And to trade is this, that David says, gosh, this law goes into effect, but I have 50 basketballs in my warehouse. He can, by government allowance, he can take that, he will have to take that, and help his competitor start his business with no benefit to him. Cap and trade. And you're being told to vote for it. It's an environmental doctrine created by environmentalists. But please understand me when I say this. I'm not attacking our environment. In fact, I, if you came to my house, honestly, I have an ecosystem at my home. I'm for it. And I praise God for every second of it. So I'm not talking about, let's blow up the environment, man. No way, man. We, uh-uh. My God made it, and we're to take care of it. But we're not to worship it. It's very important that we understand this. I haven't even gotten to the first point yet. I'll give you some verses in a few minutes. Okay, you ready? I'll just give you some verses, and then I'll repent after this tonight. Isaiah 45, 18. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens. He created the heavens, people. Who is God who formed the earth and made it, who has established it, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be what? Inhabited. Are you sitting down, everybody? California, the state of California, specifically the San Joaquin Valley, but more, uh, more prolifically, the Imperial Valley. I'll show you the data from Harvard on the California uh, on California's ability to produce fruit and vegetables. California has the ability to produce because the word inhabited here in Isaiah she inhabited how many people we have to have population control. Who said that? God said, be fruitful and multiply. I can't believe I'm hearing this. Oh, the world is overcrowded. Oh, I can't wait to get to that one. Listen, just California, according to an environmentalist, a professor of environment at Harvard. I can't think of his name. I'll get it for you later. California, if it unleashed its ability to farm, just let it go. Without, re- without regulations, California, this Harvard professor says, can f- could feed 35 billion people. Just California. The estimates of how many people we could feed from the leftovers from our plates each day is staggering. Have you ever flown across the United States? Is it inhabited? Is most of it inhabited or not inhabited? Not inhabited. Most people live in very condensed locations because they choose to. Imagine how smart God is who said he made it all and then he says go and populate. He knows what he's doing. You and I have been told in school, overpopulation, it's destroying everything. It's terrible. We're overpopulated. Too many people in the world. Who says? 
Al Gore. <laughs> Genesis 8:22. Thus says the Lord, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and winter, or cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. Who said that? God said that. Revelation 4:11. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created what? All things, and by your will, they exist and were created. He knows what he's doing. He knows how to take care of it. Genesis 2.15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. Last verse of the night. Genesis 1.28. Then God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. That word means make use of it. Be productive with it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, see, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be for food. Also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food. And it was so. God knows what he's doing. Here's my wrap-up of this thing. Environmentalism is a multi-billion dollar business. And what it does, it masters this from this time on. Remember this. It will take, that doctrine of belief will take an issue that happens locally and blow it up into a global issue. It will take the Mount St. Helen uh, volcanic eruption of the 1980s and say that the entire globe is engulfed now with volcanic ash. The temperature, anybody remember that? Yeah. The temperature of the earth is going to go down and it's going to ruin our crops because the ash of the volcano is going to cause a mini deep freeze to take place after the volcano erupted in Washington State. Did any of that happen? No. Environmentalism takes an issue and makes it a global thing because it's, it's worth billions of dollars in the media. Is there such thing as environmental care? Yes, I believe it's called creation care. And God has asked us as humans to take care of the earth. And if you love the Lord, in fact, even if you don't love the Lord and you've got a brain that God gave you and you don't even know who God is, but you're using the brain fantastically, when you see somebody throw trash out of their car, doesn't that drive you nuts? That really bugs me. I mean, I want to pull the guy over. I'm not even a cop. It's, it's, it's offensive to me. Why? Because we care about what God's given us. There is, a, there is a real, true place. But ladies and gentlemen, environmentalism will drive this year's election to a great degree of how people vote. And the young people, sad to say, the young people will fall for it hook, line, and sinker. Man, I heard that, I heard that politician say he's for the environment. I'm voting for them. And you don't even know what it's about. Don't you, don't you want to end poverty in the world? There's only one way to end poverty, and it's not through environmentalism. Don't you want to see people healthy? Don't you want to see the rest of the world do better? What does history show? What does, sh what does science show us? What's the evidence? What's the data? This is good stuff. I went too long and didn't get to the message. Lord, tonight we come and it's these issues and issues like this. Some people I would think tonight might be saying, who cares about this stuff? Especially if we're older, it's like, what? Who cares? But this is where the world is taking this doctrine and wrapping it in religious clothing or making it a campaign. And very few people are understanding the why and the how comes. And what's the truth? And our enemy is 
someone we love. Our enemy is someone we want to reach out to. And, but our enemy is yelling and screaming that this is the way it must be, this is the way it must be, and little do they know. Father, for our young people in our schools, we pray that you'd open up their eyes and speak truth into their hearts. Lord, there are kids that are being told that their parents don't know anything about this topic. And so they need to listen to this doctrine. There are kids literally being told not to ever drink again from a fruit box drink because it could hurt the environment. And our eyes are being taken off of the issue that you are God, our creator. Volcanoes will erupt Tsunamis will come and go. Ships will break apart at sea. Oil will be spilled. Planes will crash. Fires will burn the mountains and hills. And it always recovers. Your word is true. And if we look at the environment and watch what you do with it, we see your truth in action. May we as believers who see such great works of yours put our hope and faith and trust in you in all things, not some things, all things. And tonight for the young man or the young woman who doesn't know your ability to save and to create and to be the God of all salvation, the God who went to the cross and died there in our place for the forgiveness of our sins, the resurrection from the dead, that we might have eternal life with Jesus, that tonight they would say, that's my God, that's my hope, that's my rest and my trust. Put your faith in him tonight, my friends. No fret or worry can change the fact that your sins need to be forgiven. Just as no fret or worry can change the rotation of this globe, it's in his hands. And salvation is yours for the taking. Ask him to forgive you now and to wash your sins away and to come to this God of all love and all hope and all salvation, the one true God. Let's stand as we close in our song of praise and worship to him.